uh, I don't know if anybody on the, uh, on the panel has questions for each other. We've seen three remarkably convergent approaches to the explanatory <laughs> gap here. <laughs> yeah. Can I, um, I've got things I'd like to ask both, but, but, but Tony, I, I'm just confused, I'm a bit confused by the metaphysics of your view. So like th those two, you describe those two worlds A and B, one in which there's determinism and one in which there isn't. And it looks like it ought to be an objective fact about the world, whether determinism is true or not. But it looks on your view like it's dependent on how we conceptualize the world, whether determinism is true or not. That seems kind of wrong to me. No, I think determinism is true, but I, I don't oh. think it applies. Um, it's not a system that you can use when you're interacting with someone else. So then you move into a different mo mode. Kind of, you might think of it as a, a rather like, if we're interacting with someone, we would predict them. We use different heuristics to understand how we should interact with them, and so that that's where that framework becomes that is no longer useful because your own responses are going to be picked up by the other person you're interacting with them. So then, it, determinism may well be true, but it's not. It's not the framework that is that is uh, with with the heuristics that are useful to guide your interaction. So now it sounds like it's just an illusion that that. that the way we conceive of the world from the phenomenal stance, it's illusory. Because we think, you know, we think it, it makes us conceive of a non-deterministic world and the world is determined. I don't know. Well, I don't think it's an illusion to, to um, realize that the principles of determinism and science aren't going to guide your interactions with someone else very effectively. But yes, it may seem, I mean, certainly there are formulations that will make it seem like an, an illusion. And so I think it's a mistake to imagine that, um, that you should try and cash out the free will phenomenal and the notion of a soul, all of which in some sense I believe in, but to cash them out in, in terms of a mechanistic framework. Uh, right. you know, so I, I, let me come back at you because I really liked your start um, where you said, well, Descartes started like this and indeed, you know, Descartes stripped out these, he, he came from Aristotle and he got rid of you know, the, this idea of the final, um, oh, I forget the details. Yep, exactly. yep. Yeah, but yeah, okay, but anyway, and, 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 and in that way he helped, uh, he, he ushered in the scientific revolution and allowed biology to really take off. <coughs> I actually think that Descartes had a real insight in realizing that there was something there that needed to be preserved, right? So, so I think it was certainly a mistake to, in my view, to imagine it was still there um, and should interact through the pineal gland. So, so, so here's, where, here's where I depart from you. I wonder, why do you, if you're going to say that there's um, this other uh, aspect to nature, why are you so concerned about its physical properties, its extension, its causal properties? I mean, you're just, you're just playing into uh, the scientist's hands, as it were. I mean, if you're going to say it's not physical, say it's not physical. Well, but I, I want to really believe in it. I want a unified picture. So, I mean, I, I still haven't done, it seems on your view, I, the only way, I, I mean, I'm inclined to interpret your view as phenomenology doesn't really exist. It's like this, this stance we can, you know, use to interpret people. It works very well. But the world isn't really like that. I mean, the world is involved. It's just like, wait, um, particle duality. I mean, both are true. I mean, it, it, you, you know, said so they just... Wasn't true. Sorry? You said determinism wasn't true. Right, but, uh, well, okay, I don't think determinism, I think... Uh, uh, determinism is true, I said. Right, indeterminism isn't true, right? But, yeah. Um, Sorry. Um, but uh, you know, but that's an overarching theory. I still think that it's there is a sense in which it, which it is true, and it's indeed, I think a very important truth that souls exist, that moral truths exist. Like uh, you know, um, that for people have phenomenal states. So just yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I suppose there's very maybe there's a different conception of what metaphysics is all about in the background here. I mean, yes, I don't think consciousness is physical, but I think it's a real concrete part of the world. We've got this real concrete phenomenon consciousness and then we've got these facts about causal structure and I believe in both and I want a unified picture that uh, incorporates I, both. And things. I kind of agree with you and I think you know we live in a world that's so dominated by a materialistic scientific worldview we think that the only way we can call something real is to say that it's got all these physical properties but why, why, why play into that? I think actually that's, that's a sort of strategic mistake. Um, well, I just, I, f I suppose at root I find, I find your view unintelligible. If, if, you really, <laughs> if you really believe in phenomenology and, um, you, you know, there's one world out there and we want to work out what it's like. I mean, 
And you, I, I mean, I just can't make sense of this, that it's, they're just two different stances, but they're somehow... Well, I, I like the articulation Stephen Jay Gould gave in his non-overlapping magisteria, and that's uh, probably more elegant than I can state it. Uh, I mean, are the souls or aren't there? Is the determinism true or isn't there? Are the phenomenal properties or the aren't there? Souls are from, the souls it's like the relativism or something. But they're souls, but they're thoroughly, thoroughly non-physical, right? No, they don't have any physical properties at all. They certainly don't have extension and causal properties. So you're just a substance but they dualist. Exist. So you're just a substance dualist. You're a substance dualist. Um, so no, just, because I, substance I is a physical concept, isn't it? I mean, it's a metaphysical concept. It's a concept of a thing that has properties. I mean, okay. I just can't find if you intend the middle way between saying okay. substance dualism and you know intentional stance where you, it's really an illusion. But this is really fun, yeah. but we're hogging too much yeah. time. We can Sorry. argue over Sorry. a drink. Sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, general questions. Uh, Peter. I have a question to Dr. Jack. Did you, did you mean to call Dr. Oregon a psychopath? Because I think indirectly that's what you have done. Now, there is research that about 40% of people don't see first-person perspective as really deeply different. Do you want to call all the 30% of people psychopaths? Um, I, I mean, I think that people who, have a, who are completely unable to see the first-person perspective are, are likely to be suffering from some serious interpersonal problems. Um, and, uh, you know, whether you want to exactly call it psychopathy or not, yeah, I, I'm happy <laughs> with that label. I think I was very clear that I'm not applying this to academics because, and I had a slide for that effect, to, 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 because, I, you know, I think that when your reasoning is being driven, by a whole bunch of intellectual considerations, it becomes much less likely that it's just the sorts of intuitive pulls that I imagine to be the things that are pushing the opinions in my um, less educated undergraduates or less conversant with this issue undergraduates. The very well educated, the ones who go to my classes, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, it's a question for Kevin. Um, I, I'm, I'm really sympathetic to um, the project to make qualia kind of take them out of the epiphenomenal camp that's, that seems very popular nowadays. So I really think it's very important to integrate them in the causal order of the world. I even accept that you might be able to describe uh, laws of interaction with objects whereby if I instance such a law, I would have to be experiencing a red quale. Okay, so I'll go with you that far. But it seems to me it's another step to say that all there is to that red quale is such interaction. Uh, I mean, you, you, it's one thing to say that a quality is constrained by its causal profile. It's quite another thing to say that it, all it is is a set, set of, as it were, relational, dispositional, you know, uh, yeah, a profile. So I wonder why you want to take that extra step. What motivates you to do that? I think you have to be as extreme as possible and to see as, how far the argument goes. So <laughs> it seems to me that if, if there were more, you would be back to the explanatory gap. If there were more, in what terms would you explain it? Dave, can I follow on this? Sure. Um, you know, the, where, where, the, where it really struck me as, as you know, unintuitive to me, um, how, that the scheme could explain everything, was when you started talking about emotions. And um, I felt jealous that the embarrassment was so low on the scheme of experience for you. Um, but sorry that love and joy and excitement were also so low. But I, I, look, I mean, it seems to me that emotions are incredibly salient, right? Um, and I noticed that you kind of in this arrow that went up, you said sensory phenomenal experience. And, and so, I mean, again, coming back to how, how how well can you explain everything for that particular class, which I think really puts pressure on this point of, of whether you can, you can fully explain everything about them by the qualities you mentioned. Yeah, because so my whole theory was about sensory experiences. Right. So what I mean is like the five classic sense modalities. Mm -hmm. And maybe if we could go further and incorporate emotions <coughs> in it, but then we would need additional um, uh, mechanisms, I think, that we would have to build in. But I think it would be possible. For example, what, what characterizes emotions is that they're accompanied by physical manifestations in the body, uh, which normal sensations are not accompanied by. And, and I think adding that in 
for example, what I, call, I have another concept I call automaticity, which maybe you might invoke for pain, for example, if you stick your finger in the fire, well, your finger just jerks back automatically. So this is another objective fact about certain modes of interaction with you have, that you have with the world. Emotions, for example, objectively modify maybe your heart rate and your galvanic spin, skin response and stuff like that. If you incorporate these additional uh, um, factors into it, then I would hope that with the same approach, you could, again, completely describe the emotions. So, so just very briefly back on that, the only concern I have about that is that the, the areas involved in sensory motor um, you know, are anti-correlated with the areas that are involved in awareness of emotion. Um, and you know, you see this pattern that, that, that one set activates when the other deactivates. So that makes me a little bit skeptical that sensory motor properties are going to help to explain. Well, no, I mean, as I said, the notion of action in this theory uh, really only becomes important at the top right-hand corner of that diagram. That's why the emotions are lower down, because yeah. action is not so involved. Sure. Um, yes, question for Philip. Um, you mentioned uh, sim simplicity and elegance at the beginning as an advantage, but then it seems like you get very, very complex here at the end, and I'm wondering whether you know, the, the rug is just bumped up elsewhere in, your, in the theory. And second point, just to throw it in, um, I'm not sure how this is an empirical task or how empirical results really relate back to the structure. It seems like that, and even this kind of what laws are consistent, is purely in the realm of sort of formal or metaphysical. And I just don't see how this ties into empirical stuff at all. Um, can you, I, I didn't get the second part of the question. How is your view constrained by empirical results at all? Um, so I, I don't see why there's going to be complexity um, necessarily. So, you know, the, oh, it's still up there, you know, what, what we've got to work out here within this framework is, you know, what the laws of, work out sort of sim hopefully simple laws of nature, which make it the case that there are many regions of a functioning brain that are occupied by all and only the same universals, and that those, which universals are is determined by the structural properties of the whole brain. But I don't see what uh, kind of a priori reason we have to think that those laws couldn't end up being quite simple. I mean, you know, theory of consciousness is hard. Every, you know, everyone has that kind of difficulty. But um, uh, I don't see in principle what, why, you know, why this shouldn't end up with some kind of simple laws that predict that.